Welcome skeptics and truth seekers to Schoolhouse Croc, the podcast that fearlessly exposes the real deal behind public education in the state of Colorado. I am your host, Stacey Castile, and on this show, we're not here to sugarcoat. We're here to unveil the truths, challenge the norms, and unpack the crock of you-know-what that often goes unnoticed in the realm of education. On this episode, we are going to be talking about some initiatives that have been brought forward to help protect our children. Today, I have Erin Lee with me to help discuss and explain some of these initiatives and help educate everybody so that they can get involved and help protect our children. Erin, can you give us a little background on yourself? Hey, Stacey. Yeah, thanks for having me. I am a mom here in northern Colorado. I live in Wellington, which is the northernmost stop before Wyoming. And I have personal stake in the issues that I'm helping to put before the Colorado voters in November. Um, My awakening really happened in 2021 when my little girl, 12 years old, we had just moved to this town. It was the height of COVID. And she was invited to stay after school for an art club where she thought she could make some friends. And when she got there, it was actually a a secret gender and sexuality awareness club or GSA. And the teacher brought in outside activists who did unthinkable things with the kids. They told them if you're not fully comfortable in your biological sex or in your body, that means you're transgender. They asked who they were attracted to. And if you didn't know who you were sexually attracted to, that means you're queer. Uh, and they were given toys, flags, and stickers and bracelets to correspond with these new labels. Because my little girl at 12 years old, what little girl's fully comfortable in their body? Of course, she adopted that label. Um, they talked about things like polyamory, how to get puberty blockers, um, connecting privately online with these adults. They even told them that families might not be safe and it's okay to lie to your parents about where you are. And the art teacher made sure to pull my daughter aside and say, remember, you don't have to tell your mom about this. And so we were lucky that our daughter came home and told us what had happened to her. Um, But unfortunately, you know, in a 90 minute meeting, these activists whom she trusted really made her believe that she was transgender. And it, it led to nine months of a nightmare for my family um, that even resulted in suicidal ideation from our little 12-year-old daughter because she was trying to make the transgender label fit and, um, you know, was told she can't trust her parents. And so it was a really rough go for us. Uh, So now we're fighting back in a lot of ways. I think that's absolutely amazing because, um, I mean, there's a situation in the Greeley Oven School District that was brought to my attention uh, through my daughter where there is a girl who is identifying as a boy, unbeknownst to a lot of the classmates. And one of my daughter's friends had started talking with this boy romantically. And then finally, um, she the, the child who was struggling with the gender ide- identity situation came clean to the girl and said, you know, hey, I'm really a girl, but um, what ended up happening was her father was sexually assaulting her. And she felt like, if she started taking testosterone when she was 11, that that would help protect her from anybody else abusing her um, physically. Her mom goes along with it. Instead of her mom saying, this is a cry for help, my poor daughter thinks this is the only way she can protect herself. Um, She's going along with it. So, you know, this is not such a clean cut answer, right? Like there's so many different things to it. And so just to be able to have somebody else who's willing to stand and say, hey, you know, we need to do something right now, or how can we help protect our children? Because, you know, we know that there are predators out there who are preying on the the emotional, mental vulnerability of our children at, at that age. I mean, I'm in my 30s, and sometimes I don't feel comfortable in my body. Same. Same. And that little girl's story is so common. Um, I've, this was three years ago that our story happened. And I should say that we tried to handle everything the right way with the school district. They condemned us, vilified us, doubled down on their stance. Um, they even called Child Protective Services on us when we didn't agree with what they had done and pulled our daughter out of the school. So that's why we're fighting back in the way that we are. School districts are trying to assume the role of parents and completely cut us out of the equation. 
But the primary target of the agenda is these vulnerable adolescent girls, 11 to 15 years old. And a lot of them are autistic. They're on the spectrum. They're, they're misfits. They just don't quite fit in like my daughter. They've been sexually assaulted. They have trauma with male. Um, and it, it's really sad that our people who are supposed to be taking care of our children are completely violating our kids and taking advantage of their vulnerability. A hundred percent. I mean, I hear of these stories and it breaks my heart and it makes my mama heart cry and, and me actually cry. But then to then think on the other side of that, there is someone going, ha ha ha, next victim. And that's scary. Can you go ahead and uh, give us a little insight on what initiative 142 is, the parent's right to be notified of their child's gender and congruence? Yes. So I helped found an organization called Protect Kids Colorado, along with uh, former state senator Kevin Lundberg from Berthoud and a big group of people. And we're just parents, grandparents, concerned citizens. You know, one of our proponents on the initiatives is the co uh, leader of Gays Against Groomers for the state of Colorado. So we're truly a broad coalition of people. And we came together over this issue of parents shouldn't be lied to and female spaces should be protected. And so we filed, we filed numerous ballot initiatives with the title board of Colorado. Initially, we had hoped to get a comprehensive parental bill of rights. Um, but unfortunately, we filed 20 initiatives, 17 were denied. The title board, which is comprised of the attorney general and the secretary of state, uh, went so far as to say, <laughs> right, and they're both elected, very, very left-leaning elected officials said that the word parent was too confusing for Colorado voters to understand, that it was too broad to be a single subject. And so we battled completely unconstitutional, illegal behavior from the Secretary of State and Attorney General. We went through this gauntlet. And so the three that we got through out of the 20 we filed, we were then sued by an organization called One Colorado, which is the main LGBTQ organization. They're funded by you know, polis, um, you know, national interest groups, they have millions and millions of dollars. And they spent over $100,000 trying to challenge us and then suing us to the Supreme Court to slow us down. So we are so fortunate to have these two initiatives that made it through that gauntlet. It was a fight just to get where we are now. Um, but we have two initiatives. 142 is very simple. It's one sentence. It just says if a child is experiencing gender incongruence, meaning, you know, having a um, dysphoria over their sex, their biological sex, you must tell the parent. It's that simple. And we get the argument like, this is anti-trans and you're trying to take away our rights. It's like, we're not taking away anyone's rights. And if a parent chooses to transition their own child, they still have that prerogative, according to this law. But you can't transition my child and not tell me. That's all this does. I think that that's the thing that's so scary and alarming is that, and, and it's not just in this aspect, um, it's something that I've actually battled with our school district in regards to the books. I mean, it's basically come down to, um, we did a huge push to have, um, to, to some of these books that are like, hmm, these are probably a little inappropriate, to at least have the parents be notified prior to the book being checked out. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, they plain and simple told me, because I pushed back and I pushed back, and they said, if we were to notify you before the child checked the book out, that would be a violation of their First Amendment right. But I can notify them that I don't want my child to have access to this book. And that's not a violation of their First Amendment right. Well, doesn't this look exactly like what the transgender um, ideology situation is, is, you know, if the parent comes to the table, then the school is totally fine working with them. But if the parent isn't the one that comes to the table, then they're totally fine not having the parent involved. That's insane. Our, our parental rights do not stop at the schoolhouse door. And a minor is a minor is a minor. So the way we've defined Initiative 142 is that this law applies to all minors. That means 17 year, years old. You're, you're still a child. You still are under the guidance and care of your parents. And so we have every right to know what's happening with our kids and to have a say on what they're exposed to. And the stakes have really been raised. This initiative is even more important now because about three weeks ago, Jared Polis signed a law, signed a bill into law 1039, which now requires teachers to call a child whatever they want to be called 
no age distinction, and no requirement to tell the parent. And when I challenged Senator Janice Marchman, who represents my district, I said, um, you know, what if five-year-old Billy wants to be Sally and the parents say, don't transition my child? She said, well, then we will respect Sally's wishes. And so they're explicit. Like, we're going to transition five-year-olds, even if parents don't, don't want us to, and we're going to do it behind their backs. And so we're, if we get this on the ballot, it absolutely will become law, and then we'll guarantee that parents are informed. But if you're transitioning my five-year-old, you have to tell me what you're doing. Exactly. Well, and I think, too, like with, you know, um, the non-legal name change situation, there's, I mean, there's not even a note that has to go to the school that says, like, hey, I'm aware that, you know, Billy wants to be Sally and I'm good with it. Like, they, they, I mean, Billy can say he's Sally and then Johnny and then Leah, like, it, a cat. It, it, yeah, it, a dog. There's no end to it. It's completely open. Okay. And that's what's really concerning. Really concerning. And it's unconstitutional for speech on the teacher. So our initiative won't rectify that issue. The way 1039 stands, the teacher's forced to lie to these children against the truth, against potentially their religious beliefs. It's unconstitutional. They think it will be challenged pretty heavily in the court. Um, But no matter what, we have got to ensure that parents know what's going on. We're, We're a case of you know, the suicide myth gets sold to parents. You must affirm or your child will kill themselves. It's sold to the teachers, too. You must call the child whatever they want to be called or they'll kill themselves. And the opposite is true. We're experienced of that. And if you socially transition a child and lead them down this path of confusion, especially outside the purview of their parents, they are far more likely to become depressed and suicidal. So we're we're trying to help change that because and there's parents that, being involved saves kids. Yes. And there's that mom uh, down in Texas who was told, you know, would you rather have a dead daughter or a trans son? And so she ends up losing custody of her daughter. And then her daughter, you know, transitions and all of this other stuff. It, I think it's, I don't know if it's surgically transitions or just socially transitions, but ends up going and kneeling on a train track because that, the only solution that this poor child felt like there was left in life. And the mom's sitting there going, I did what they told me I was supposed to, and it still went wrong. And, you know, yeah. now nobody's here to answer. Um, well, and I encourage people to listen to Sage's story out of Virginia. There was a little girl named Sage who was at 13 years old, transitioned at school, and her grandma, who was her permanent caretaker, her parents passed away, uh, was not informed. And she was encouraged to connect with the Trevor Project online to chat, you know, with unsafe adults in a secret environment. And they coached her to run away. And she was sex trafficked for months when grandma went to get her back and but wouldn't affirm the new gender identity, the state would not give her back. She was then sex trafficked again from Maryland to Texas. I mean, this little girl, she's lucky to be alive. She's definitely permanently scarred. And it started with a secret social transition of school. Name and pronouns is not harmless. And Sage's story is really hard evidence of that. So I encourage people to look into that as evidence of why this law is so necessary. Yes, and what about Initiative 160, prohibiting biological males from participating in girls' sports? I feel like that's pretty obvious, but can you give us a little that's bit more it. background? <laughs> These initiatives are so straightforward. It, it would just make a rule in K-12 through public schools that biological males cannot participate in female single-sex sports. So that's not to say if there's a co-ed activity, um, this is not going to segregate males and females entirely. But it is going to make it so that, you know, the strictly female category is not open to biological males. Uh, I'm sure everyone's heard of Riley Gaines. It's it's that kind of situation where she worked her whole life and was the best at her sport. And this biological male got to come in and say he was a female and take her opportunities away and take her victories away. And we want to make sure that single sex spaces for females are protected because there's absolutely a biological difference between males and females. That's just science. A hundred percent. My daughter runs track and I'm against males, biological men participating in biological women, female sports. And I always like to look, okay, who got first place in the 100 meter dash for the men and what was his time and who got first place for the girls in the 100 meter dash and what was her time? And I mean, there's always a 
a two second at least difference. And I know like two seconds doesn't seem that much, but in that world, right, where they're counting down milliseconds, that is important. Two seconds is a lot. And yeah. it's it's scary, you know, and even as a, a girl growing up who played sports, you know, I could play football um, at recess with the boys. I could play football at PE with the boys, but they would not, they f- would fight if I had said I wanted to play football um, at the competitive level with the boys. Um, no, you're a girl, you're going to get hurt. Well, how does that all disappear magically when it's a guy who says, you know, I want to participate? And and we hear all of these stories about biological men wanting to participate in, in women's sports, but we never hear stories about biological women who are you know, coming into biological men's sports, right? And breaking records and taking opportunities away. Why is, like, how is this making sense to anybody? Um, because it, it doesn't. There's a reason that, you know, women aren't necessarily coming in and dominating. I'm not saying that a, a woman wouldn't necessarily take over, you know, maybe the last half of the, you know, rankings, but she's not going to be taking first place like what Leo Thomas was doing to, to Riley Gaines. No, in those cases, when, uh, you know, female to male, they call it females impersonating males, participate in male sports, they come in dead last. Almost consistently, they come in dead last. And I know a lot of people say, oh, this is a non-issue in Colorado. This is absolutely happening at the K through 12 level in Colorado. I've talked to many young girls who have experienced males participating in their female sports spaces. So it's an issue here. It's not as prevalent as children being transitioned behind their parents' back. But both are issues that are happening in Colorado, though. And it's been so cool to see the people coming behind it, like the radical feminists who fought for decades for these rights to have a single-sex yep. space. If it, There's a reason like they're, they're not conservative. <laughs> right. And people who fundamentally disagree with my conservative values on every level, we agree that men are not women. And that theme is all spaces we fought so hard to have then. We can't go backward from here. That transgender individuals should have their own separate category. They still deserve to be able to compete, just not in the, sp- in the female spaces if they're biological males. Exactly. And, you know, this is the other thing that I just don't quite understand is, um, I mean, I understand having a competitive gene, right? I'm super competitive myself. But also, I know that, you know, some of my athletic skills aren't very good. And so instead of trying to compete at the varsity level or, you know, the competitive level, like there's always lower levels that you can go to. You can go to rec levels. There's co-ed levels. Like there are other options out there for you. How are the feminists behind this? You know, because it is blatantly biological males coming in and, and taking away from biological females and... It doesn't make sense how they would go on to support it. So there are. Nope. And an overwhelming amount of people agree. So what's so cool is on a national level, over 80% of people agree that males should not participate in female sport. And we're working on uh, some polling data, data here in Colorado. So we have Colorado specific, but it's just a really favorable issue. So it's been cool to be out there with our petitions and people like, absolutely, I want to sign people of every walk of life. We all agree that this is common sense. And it's kind of ridiculous that we have even had to put these forward. It should have just been common sense. There should be laws that already protect parents' right to know what's happening with their kids and female spaces. But here we are. And we, the people, are taking control of the process to cre- try to create these laws. Yes, exactly. So you mentioned having petitions. I know a handful of people that have petitions. I have a petition. So if anybody is interested in signing a petition, please reach out to me. I will leave my email address to be contacted by in the notes for the show. And is there a way that people can contact you, Erin, or your Protect Kids Colorado group, and whether they want to sign a petition or if they want to carry a petition? Yes. So anyone can go to protectkidscolorado.org and we have uh, ways that you can sign up to carry a petition right there on the website and we'll get you connected to your closest distribution point. Or our events page is constantly updated with opportunities to sign where there will be petition circulators. So we just printed them uh, a little under two weeks ago. We've got all our distribution points set up and now it's go time. We, we are trying to get petitions in hands of anyone who wants to help us get this on the ballot. 
And so we need 125,000 signatures statewide. And our deadline to turn these back in is July 31st. So we've just got two months to get all these signatures that we need. Awesome. Thank you so much. I mean, one, for getting this going and, and fighting for children. I assume that you get a lot of pushback that, you know, worry about your own kids. Because um, I've gotten that in regards to, you know, this, the books in the library. You know, just worry about your own kids. Don't worry about other kids. But the problem is, is that we need somebody to to stand up for our kids so that we can also feel empowered and encouraged to stand up for our kids because, you know, courage is a habit, right? Like there's a whole organization that's called that. And I think that, you know, seeing people who are willing to stand up and say, you know what, this isn't right. I'm, I'm not only fighting for your child, but I'm fighting for you as a parent. And so I just really appreciate you taking this initiative, creating these, fighting as hard as you have. I know that you get a lot of hate, a lot of pushback. And so I do appreciate you just keep pushing through and fighting for the, the children and the parents. Oh, thank you so much. And it, we, we all have a shared responsibility, even if you don't have kids. <laughs> this is our next generation, and there's nothing more important than protecting um, the innocence of our children, of the next generation of, of people who are going to be, you know, running society. Yes. So we all have a shared responsibility to take care of them. And my hope is that we've made a really easy way for people to get involved by just signing your name or circling the bubble on your ballot to make these things happen. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. And um, thank you guys for listening. I will go ahead and add in the website for Protect Kids Colorado in the notes as well as my email address. Um, And let's just get out there and get these petitions signed so that we can overwhelm the Secretary of State with signatures and get this on the ballot so it can go forward to all the Colorado voters so that we can have a stay and to stand up against Jared Polis and any of the left-wing radicals that are trying to prey on our children and take them away from us and take away our parental rights. So thank you guys, and have a great day.